Thank you for taking uh, time to take my class. Uh, I'm Jean Abras. Um, I uh, wrote a few books uh, about real-time kernels, real-time operating system. I've done lectures all around the, the world. Uh, founded a company called Micrium, which was acquired by Silicon Labs a couple of years ago. And uh, pretty much it. So let's talk about uh, what is an RTOS. So I'm going to do a quick introduction about what RTOSs are very, very uh, quickly. So it brings everybody up to speed with that. So an R RTOS is software that manages the time of a CPU. Uh, it splits the application into multiple tasks. Each task is responsible for a portion of the application that you're developing as a developer. So an RTOS provides services to your application, so such as task management, time management, uh, message services, uh, resource management, and so on. So what I like about this little drawing is it kind of shows the fact that an RTOS is event-driven. So an event comes in and I interrupt service routine or any type of other events, whether it's a task that sends a message to another task or signals another task. And the RTOS's job is to choose the next most important task that's ready to run. So here's a linked list of all the tasks that are ready to run. And of course, the RTOS will pick the most important one out of that list. So very important un concept to understand. An RTOS is simply uh, a piece of software that you add to at your application that provides services, multitasking services to your application. So most RTOSs are called preemptive schedulers. And what that means is that if a low priority task is currently executing and there's an interrupt that comes in, and the interrupt service routine, of course, gets to execute, assuming that interrupts are enabled, uh, at that point, the interrupt service routine takes over the, the, the CPU takes, the ISR takes over the CPU, the ISR executes. Within the ISR, there's something that notifies a task that is waiting for that specific event to occur. When that happens, uh, the event is simply uh, sent to the, uh, to the RTOS. At the completion of the ISR, the RTOS evaluates whether or not the event that was signal is the event for a more important task to execute or whether or not the event is for a less important task to execute. If it is, in fact, for a more important task, the RTOS doesn't return back to the interrupted task. Instead, it switches over to the more important task, which is pretty much does what it's supposed to do. It runs the highest priority task that's, all, that's ready to run. So upon completion of the high priority task, the high priority task goes in and says, let me wait for that event to occur again. And then when, if the event did not occur, then the RTOS decides, OK, you can't do anything. Your event has not occurred a second time. What I will do is I will go back to the interrupted task and continue execution as if nothing happened. So in a nutshell, that's pretty much uh, what that is. The red portions of that indicates RTOS services. So those are API calls that are performed by the RTOS to actually do the signaling of, of events. <clears throat> So really, an, a, a task, when it exists in your application, really has five aspects to it. First of all, a task has a priority. And then you decide, as the application developer, what priority you give to your task based on the importance of each of your tasks. So the task also has its own set of CPU registers. As far as the task is, con is concerned, it thinks it owns the, the CPU, even though there are other tasks in the system. That specific task thinks it has all the CPU registers, so the integer registers, the FPU registers, and so on. So as far as a task is concerned, uh, it also has its own stack space. So each task in a multitasking application requires its own stack space, and that presents challenges on its own. Each task has also potentially access to variables, data structures, array, whatever the task does as a function. And optionally, a task can own I.O. devices, so peripheral device, Ethernet controllers, USB controllers, and so on. So each task has these things. Uh, so uh, as a general rule, also, a task is always implemented as an infinite loop. So the task initializes just like it just looks like standard C code. It initializes, wait for an event to occur. The event could be an ISR. The event could be another task signaling that task. Or the event could be a message being sent from another task. So whatever the event is, that specific task waits for that specific event. Whenever the event occurs, the task 
gets scheduled by the RTOS and then the task gets to execute and perform the operation for that event. Uh, so this is what an RTOS looks like without a physical memory protection unit, without PMP. So all the memory is shared between all the different tasks in the application. So I show all the different tasks in as uh, circles, all the I.O. devices as squares, and then all the ISRs as ovals. And uh, certainly there's some problems associated with that, but the, the reason it's done like this typically is because of performance reasons. So uh, the the RTOS and the application shares the same space or the same uh, system space or, or, or privilege uh, state. So a lot of the RTOSs today don't have the notion of privilege, non-privilege. It has the notion of I, I own the whole thing even at the task level. So there's a lot of drawbacks to that. The task could disable interrupts, not a good thing. The task could write to any other's task memory, not a good thing. So all these uh, these things are not really good if you're not using uh, physical memory protection units. So that's why it's interesting to actually add a physical memory protection unit to the application. So from the, from the non-physical memory protection unit point of view, a context which, or me, which means going from one task to another is simply saving the CPU registers on the right-hand side to the task that's being preempted, and then restoring the CPU registers of the task being started from, by the RTOS. So a context switch in that case without a physical memory protection unit is pretty straightforward. <clears throat> and everybody does that like that. Now, if we're adding a pr a physical memory protection, phys a PMP is a, f is a piece of hardware that it's basically putting boundaries around memory locations so that a task or a series of tasks is only allowed to play within that physical memory uh, area. And if it attempts to write uh, to physical memory outside of that boundary, or outside of that fence, then the task will, well, the CPU will generate an exception and then the exception handler will have to decide, well, what do we do? He's trying to access memory that he is not allowed to, so what do we do? So <clears throat> if also all these tasks are grouped into what's called a process. So all these three tasks are grouped together in a, in a physical memory area. And then each task here has access to the memory shared by the other task. Uh, in this particular case, this, this, these three tasks does not have any access at all to the memory locations, the variables, the data structures, the arrays that are shared with, within, within process number two here. There's a physical boundary if there's any attempt to access memory outside of the process number one's address space, then the CPU generates an exception because of the PMP, the, the physical memory protection generates an exception and the CPU says, okay, what do I do with the task? He's trying to access something that he's not supposed to, so we'll get into some of that. Uh, it's also possible to set up the memory pr protection mechanism where two processes can actually share memory. So for example, you have a protocol stack, a networking stack, TCP IP, that receives commands and stuff from, from an application from a, a remote server. And it, these commands, so the TCP IP stack, for example, would be running in here, but what it's receiving is data or commands from another server somewhere that says, oh, by the way, change the behavior of this process. Maybe this is a control loop, maybe this motor control. I'm changing parameters, I'm changing gains, I'm changing uh, all kinds of stuff. So the shared memory would be a place where this process knows about this process through the shared memory. He cannot access directly memory here, but certainly process two, uh, one and three could share a, a common memory area. So the good news about that is by using the PMP, we're able to isolate all these different tasks, if you want, or into processes, and uh, each process has a lot of limitations they can't do, so you're really protecting uh, the environment that you're designing uh, under. Um, okay, so, so each, pro each process requires what's called a process table. So in the case of the RISC-V PMP, there are 16 addresses that are used for that, and then there's four uh, where there's 16 sets of attributes that determines whether or not a specific region is write-only, read-only, read-writable, uh, execute or not execute. So these attributes apply to the boundary or the fencing that we've done around the different uh, processes. <clears throat> 
So now a context which simply, since there's a process table that contains information, and the process table is typically de developed at uh, compile time, at design time, the process table simply needs to be loaded into the physical memory protection unit upon a context switch. Now the good news is the context switch, this code here belongs to the RTOS, and the RTOS runs in a privilege mode as opposed to user code which runs in a non-privilege mode. So the RTOS knows about this process table because when you create each one of your tasks, when you tell the RTOS about all your different tasks, you're also specifying this process table that specify what's, fen what's the fencing that you give around the memory locations uh, for your application. So let's say this is the fencing for process number one. So when there's a context switch, there's a task within process number one, whenever that task executes or needs to execute, the CPU saves the previous context, loads the new CPU registers into the CPU, loads the process table into the, the PMP, and from that point on, the memory is protected against uh, accessing memory outside of this fencing that's established by this table, all right? Uh, well, one, one interesting thing is there is no need to actually store the value of this table because this table is typically located in flash. So there's no need to actually save it into RAM. You could just load it from the process table for each of the different processes. Okay, so, yes. Different process table for each process? There's a different process table for each process, and in fact, the same process table could be used for, this, for all the different tasks within a process, except for one thing, and that is to establish uh, the stack pointer, because the stack pointer uh, location. So what, what we would do is you would load all 15 locations, and the last location you'd load is the boundary, if you want, or the fencing to protect the stack of that task. So yes, it's the same process table for each task within a process, all right? Uh, so, okay, so the other thing is since the RTOS runs in privilege mode and user code runs in user mode, there needs to be a mechanism to transition from user mode, non-privileged, things that you cannot do, you can't disable interrupts, you can't uh, access the PMP, you cannot change the PMP because that's something that's protected by the RTOS. So in order to perform RTOS services, there needs to be, whoops, I'm going too fast here. There needs to be a mechanism that actually allows user code to make service calls or API calls to the RTOS. So here there's a little piece of code called a machine mode handler. The machine mode handler takes user request uh, in user mode and translates them to RTOS services in privilege mode because the RTOS has to run in privilege mode. You have to bring from one mode to the other and that's the only way you could do that. So, uh, and the other thing that's interesting here is that there's a table that, uh, that basically offers the user mode specific services and not all the RTOS services. For example, you don't want the user to delete a task or kill a task because if you're giving that privilege, you could do bad things by letting the user uh, decide on killing a uh, task. So instead you're saying, I will allow you to send messages to another task, I will allow you to uh, grab a mutex, I will allow you to do certain things, but there are certain things I don't want you to do, and because of that, what happens is you don't put that in the list of services that are available from user mode to system mode. So. Uh, <clears throat> so anyways, it adds a little bit of overhead to do this, but at least you're getting some, some benefits from having uh, the user mode and privilege mode difference. So what I show here is a memory map, a quick memory map, where I, I have uh, uh, code space at the bottom, RAM in the middle, and peripheral devices at the top. And what I expanded here is I expanded process number A, which contains, in this case, four tasks and then a specific heap area for that process and process variables. Now, ideally, you would swap that around. You'd put the RAM here, the stacks here at the bottom, and you put the heap and the process variables at the top. And there's a, a good reason you'd want to do that, but I didn't show it like this on, on this slide. But the idea is that each process has, in this case, all the RAM available, so that fencing around the, the memory for the process, all these different tasks have access to each other's memory location. 
A couple of things in here is that there's four tasks. There's a little bit red zone area that allows you to actually detect stack overflows, which is a big problem with multitasking system because each task has to have its own stack. How much stack space do you allocate for each task depends on the application. If you don't allocate enough stack space, you will write into memory locations you're not allowed to. So this red zone is kind of there to to do that, some of that protection. It's not ideal, but it's better than, than nothing. Okay, what I also wanted to show here is, uh, this thing is slow. Uh, I wanted to show here, this is the PMP registers. This is the, the, the blue things here. It's kind of an eye chart if you're sitting in the back, if you could read this, you know, you, you win a prize because you're good. Um, so this is, this is the PMP uh, uh, mapping. So these are the names that the PMP or the physical memory protection unit in the RISC-V uses. So you would set the base address for code space. You would set the base address for, uh, so these are all the registers in that process table that you would set. There's a whole bunch of them. So you set all these registers in the process table and then whenever you run a context switch, when the RTOS runs a context switch, it would actually load those value, all those pointers into the PMP. And from that point on, the PMP knows, well, the valid memory locations is from here to here. Oops, there's no, there's no blue lines here, so there's nothing here. So that means that this code here running with this RAM, this, the code here for the, uh, for the uh, orange would not be allowed to access this because that's, it's not that programmed to, to give access to that memory location. Anyway, bottom line is the, the PMP is loaded with a configuration that allows it to put a fence around the memory locations that the process is only allowed to access. So this is an expanded view, and what I show here is that little red zone at the bottom. So if ever the stack grows to a certain point where a write is done into this red zone, then the, the PMP would generate an exception and say, hey, you're not allowed to write to that. Most likely you're overflowing your stack, and because of that, we want to catch that as a fault. So this is a kind of a crude way to actually detect stack overflow. The ideal thing would be to put a large red zone at the, at the very bottom of the stack, and anytime something is written to that location, that would get generate an exception, and we'd be off uh, with that. Um, okay, so handling faults. So what happens when, hey, you're writing in a memory location you're not supposed to, what do you do? Well, that depends on the application. If you're controlling a motor, you don't want to just kill the task and, and, or reset the whole, the whole application. So what you'd probably want to do is you'd want to run a shutdown sequence that says, hey, I'm running a motor. That particular task or a particular task was trying to write in the memory location that it wasn't allowed to. So I'm going to run a shutdown sequence, maybe sh shut down the motor in a control fashion instead of just killing it and just restarting. That would be potentially disastrous. So uh, what you do when a fault is detected is really application specific. The RTOS gives you a hook or a callback function that allows you to go in and define it exactly what it is uh, you would like it to do. Uh, so what, you know, so one of the things is you want to be able to report that there's a fault that happened. So typically, you know, whenever you're doing this, it, in the lab, you will never catch fault, but as soon as the unit ships, that's when, that's when these faults will occur. So you will want to be able to record these, uh, this information, store it somewhere, feed that back to the developers so they can make corrective actions for the next patch of software. Uh, so, of course, <clears throat> you may want to terminate the offending task. In fact, you may want to terminate the offending process. So there are multiple tasks within a process. You may want to kill all the tasks associated with that process and restart the whole process if that's something you want to do. Now, clearly, if, if the process that you're running is graphical user interface and it's, it attempts to write into memory location that it's not supposed to, Killing the user interface and restarting it may not be the end of the world, but if, if the process that's at fault is a motor control or, or some safety critical application, you may want to do that corrective action that I was mentioning about make sure that you're not uh, damaging any assets or, or worse yet, uh, killing people. And finally, um, so as a minimum, there's a neat feature in all these uh, memory protection units or PMP that's called the execute never. You could you could prevent a lot of hack hacking by preventing code from being executed 
executing out of RAM, which is a very neat feature. So as a minimum, uh, if you're using the PMP, you don't want to go through the complexity of linker scripts and stuff. As a minimum, you may want to just set that, uh, that execute never bit where it would prevent uh, 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 executing code out of RAM. Uh, use the red zone thing to protect the stack, run the application code in user mode, uh, and so on, this whole bunch of other recommendations.